my pleasure to open the, this session, talk the session, on schools facing entrepreneurship. It's a truly special session, uh, first of all, because most of the companies around me did not even exist a decade ago. And so, as you know, this uh, flagship annual conference is a moment to take stock of our ecosystem, gather the key stakeholders, and looking at the program this year, and specifically this uh, session, one thing is clear, the space domain is no longer reserved for institutional representatives only in big multinationals. And indeed, the new space revolutionized the space sector with innovative technologies, entrepreneurial activities, new models for R&D, commercialization, to name a few. There's also spurring synergies with other industries, such as automotive and digital services. It's fair to say that innovation and global competitiveness of our European space sector is now hugely dependent on the space entrepreneurship. And now, the topic of today, how to boost this uh, space entrepreneurship. What are our challenges to overcome, and what are the opportunities? My question to you today would be, are you seeing a change in the mindset of entrepreneurship, first of all, and what initiatives will you join to support space innovation and entrepreneurship, and what is the long-term long impact? Thanks so much. I know that it's Two, freedom. Um, they were telling us, don't impose too many requirements. Don't, be, don't put yourself in a kind of straitjacket mode. And three, contracts. We need contracts. Okay? So the challenge this year was trying to implement your requirements. Uh, and I think we've managed to really listen to those requirements. Speed. Uh, the way we have worked together with ESA to change uh, the way we register for employment, for instance, paternity contribution emissions, was a huge challenge. But we were ready to cope with that challenge. And I think we've managed to change a bit the mindset and then turn that mindset into the new coping design. Um, so acting then as, as anchor customer, contracts, we need contracts. That's something that we have changed. Uh, we are buying services directly from certain startups when it comes to paternity consumption emissions. We will do the same for uh, uh, launches uh, to uh, buy um, launch services from new launching systems to uh, the flagship of Nunchaku. And Iron Squared, you know, the possibility to buy services to some of your companies directly as part of the big, big flagship is really at the heart uh, of this new space flagship. So, you know, that we have listened to your, uh, to your concerns. And then, um, agility, I'd like to mention that as well. And together with ESA, we really have to try to align uh, our different tools, instruments, events, that you are kind of one-stop shop where you find all the information, you can turn to one thing, you're not competing, you're acting together to really support the development of the, the, the quick emergence of the new space before we're convinced that we can act on it. Um, it's 
not on a new uh, basis of the, the large scale to be payments, but it's really finding a way for you to add value and to replace what is it, the, the space crisis, to the way you do space in Europe. And we're very proud of this project, at least to see that this is happening. Um, we are very proud as well to see that we have more and more VCs, venture capital funds, willing and ready to invest in space. We have a tiny token VC stands very much behind our effort, and that we are very proud as well to see that happen. So the big challenge for 2023 remains speed. Uh, we need to see uh, quick delivery uh, about that to ensure that uh, your startup will really become scale up, stay with you, and, and get access to uh, what you need uh, in the business. to turn to you so that you can also let us know what role can the IF play in helping startups and SMEs to access finance. Sure. Um, maybe uh, very briefly, for those who don't know us, uh, at the EIF, uh, okay, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, no, it works, okay. Uh, so maybe you heard very briefly the intro speech of our newly appointed uh, chief executive, Mariut, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, we are the investment arm of the European Union when it comes to supporting and providing capital to innovative SMEs. But we do it in an intermediated mode, meaning that we do not invest directly into companies or projects, but through uh, VC funds. So we are investing into VC funds, and we've been doing that for more than 25 years. Over the years, we have backed more than 700 VC funds across Europe. So we have a quite nice coverage of what's happening in Europe. We have been exposed to a number of players in uh, almost each and every EU country and even beyond when uh, we, we could do so. So what can we do at the IF? we are investing capital that we are managing on behalf of various entities. And one of them being the European Commission, and as Guillaume just uh, uh, explained, we have some objectives which are not only financial ones, meaning that for sure, when we invest into a fund, we are looking for financial returns. But importantly enough, we are also looking at the same time for policy objectives. And by policy objectives, we mean supporting and even fostering some sectors which have been identified as being strategic for the EU technological sovereignty, which includes new space. So what are we doing in space? We have been investing a pilot program a couple of years ago, which was called the Innofin Space Pilot Program. It was a 100 million euros program dedicated to space, and we invested into a couple of fully dedicated space funds, more generic deep tech funds with a partial focus on space, and also co-investments. Now, with this new program called InvestEU, uh, which is associated to this Cassini initiative, we have much bigger means to support the market. At the same time, we will not make a kind of deployment. We are making investment decisions. So we are looking for projects which are well equipped to generate the highest financial and policy objectives. So we are applying our uh, analysis and criteria that we have been using uh, for 25 years which have been adapted to over time for sure, but we are always being, we have always been very demanding and we will continue doing so to identify and select those who, in our view, are the best to uh, generate those higher returns. Uh, and it will be done through not only providing capital to the companies and to startups, but smart capital, meaning that they will need to bring added value to the companies. Thank you. We'll come back to, we'll come back to you actually into some of those points at the end of panel again. Now I would like to turn to our panelists representing the launcher industry as uh, those companies are already revolutionizing access to space and gaining huge popularity in Europe. Um, currently there are both of startups and established companies aiming to capture the small satellite launch market. And my question for all of you would be what makes you different? What makes you different? And uh, Ruf, I would like to start with you. Um, what makes you space unique? Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you. I'm happy to stay here. So yes, uh, competition is hard, as you see. Thank you to join in the same panel, all my competitors here. So happy to stay with all of you. Um, differentiation, of course, it's very important. But um, also availability for us is one of the keys, uh, because the, the market is asking for new flight opportunities uh, using small launchers, medium launchers, and launchers in general, in my opinion. So for us, uh, to have the rocket available uh, as much time as we can, not just to achieving the first one to the market, uh, but to offering, let me say, a dense, uh, or the density of the manifest uh, to be bigger, to fly from different spaceports. So uh, these kind of things, uh, it will make the difference in, in that very, very hard uh, competition we have today. 
and um, and of course price. So price, it will be one of the keys. Uh, I don't know if in the institutional market, but in the commercial market, it, it will be one of one of the uh, one of the keys also. And our let me say our cost breakdown and how we manage uh, not just the let me say the recurrent part of the rocket, also how many millions we need to achieve the market. I think PLD Space is one of the most competitive companies there. And also the other one, uh, it's because we call us the original micro launcher company. We found the company in 2011 when nobody's talking about that. Um, and our understanding of the market and the maturity level of, of our business is, uh, let me say, quite high. Uh, we are following, let me say, uh, how the others, they are progressing. And, and we made that, let me say, less or less two years ago. So I think that's one of the three pillars of our competitive advantages. Thank you so much, Bill. Europe, what do you do differently in RFA, and how are you approaching the competition? Yeah, I can obviously say now all the same points again, and <laughs> beyond that, <laughs> no, I think for us uh, what makes us specifically different is the level of technology that we worked on. Um, we have a great team that had done this before. And with that, we managed to develop a very high-performing engine, which is a stage combustion engine that stands out in the competition and gives us much more payload performance at a much cheaper price point. And with that, we can offer a unique service with a high payload capacity to space, 1.3 tons, no one else is there, developing a small launch system at, at a really attractive price point. And combining that with the orbital stage that we have on top of our launcher, um, it will give you high injection accuracy, a lot of mission flexibility around that service. Um, what a lot of people nowadays call fancy in-space transportation is something we are doing since four years and building that um, in one company into our launch system straight from the beginning. And this will, this will make a, a big change, I think, to the market. And it's very fragmented today. And hopefully once we're launching within year from year, that uh, this hopefully will be available all out of one hand. Thanks a lot. I'll turn to the other side of our panel, Chris. I would like to turn to you. How much you raised up to now? And we have a timeline for launching the first payload. I feel like Justin Bieber here. <laughs> Hello. Okay, there we go. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Chris Larmer. I'm um, founder and CEO of Orbex. Um, we differentiate because we're based in the United Kingdom and not the EU. <laughs> Sorry about that. It wasn't my decision. Um, we've raised about $100 million so far. That's everything we need to get to launching for the first few times. Um, we're also sold out for the first four years of launching now. Um, with real hard tens of millions of dollars contracts. Um, we're also operating a private spaceport, the first private spaceport, I think, in Europe. Um, not the EU, but in Europe. And um, we focus on being very um, sustainable. Our launcher uses a renewable fuel, biopropane, which cuts our CO2 footprint by 95% compared to launchers like Virgin Orbit that uses uh, highly refined kerosene. Um, we're going to be launching in about a year. We're on the run down to launch now. So in about a year, there will be um, a new launch solution in Europe that will be an alternative for customers to turn to for small payloads. That's going to be, I think, a significant change when we see operational micro-launchers rather than PowerPoint micro-launchers. And uh, we'll see who gets there first, but I know we'll be launching in roughly that time frame. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Oh, Daniel, last but not least from the launch industry here today, what about this our perspective? What's unique way of this our so, uh, well, we joined the, the, joined the ranks of the school class here about four years ago. Um, and uh, probably one of the things uh, we've realized is that uh, the space industry is massively growing. I mean, just if you take a look at all the small sets launched, uh, the ambitions of all the constellations grew. And necessarily also you need to grow, uh, grow the, the launch capabilities. And in that sense, uh, we very much focus on scalability. Um, so since day one, basically, we've been focusing on an automated manufacturing uh, because there's, there's companies who can, uh, who can do a one-trick pony and get to orbit, but the question is, uh, can you launch 20 times, 30 times, 100 times a year? And uh, that's one of the elements uh, where uh, we've been putting a lot of effort, which naturally always obviously drives uh, bringing down manufacturing cost, uh, because a robot, uh, after a certain time, is always uh, less expensive than, uh, than uh, many people manually working on, uh, on rockets. And so uh, it's really about scalability and, uh, and uh, having a strong throughput, whereas, again, already before first launch, we know actually that we can uh, reach our price targets. Uh, so we've been uh, building rocket engines uh, every week. And uh, again, that's one of the things uh, we, we focus on uh, significantly. Well, that's great. Thanks a lot. Um, before we move on to the downstream, actually, we have the only non-launcher company part of the upstream with us today as well. I, I'll come on from the panel. I mean, have 
founder at Infosion. So we know that Infosion is a market leader in Infosion technology. What's the market potential of this technology? And how did you manage to grow Infosion from an academic idea into a global profitable? Yeah, thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm very lucky not to, um, you know, having to <laughs> stand out in front of my competition here. Um, Impulsion um, was lucky in a way, or we were lucky in a way, that we had a technical solution uh, to a, uh, a scientific problem in, with, you know, decades of research development funded by ESA and also the European Commission in place when the whole microsatellite and, and you know, uh, constellation market kind of exploded. So we're the only ones who were able to provide a technical solution for that, and we captured that market quite, uh, quite nicely. And uh, in, for the last couple of years, we've been able to grow organically and scale up you know, with our own revenues and, and profits. Uh, obviously, our competition is not sleeping as well, so no, you know, also other solutions are coming to the market uh, uh, right now, and that's a good thing, because competition drives you to, to be better. You all know that, I guess, uh, on this panel. Uh, but the interesting part is that for us, uh, as you asked, you know, how we get, got there, we got a lot of institutional support in the very early stages and in the technology development stages, and then not so much in the, in the scaling, you know, uh, in industrialization um, uh, stages. I'm happy to discuss more later about this. Yeah, we'll turn back to this topic if we need. Um, then let's move on just to complete our ways of introduction in a way with Francisco. We know that uh, space already plays a key role in addressing global challenges. That cannot be truer when it comes to Earth observation. Can you tell us how is GeoSat changing the approach to Earth observation? Yes, thank you very much, Thomas. In fact, I think we are on the verge of a change in the market of, of the EO industry. Uh, GeoSat is a relatively recent uh, player, but it deploys a decades long in operating European satellites. And what we are seeing is that, in fact, the major opportunity we have in the future is this democratization of the EO industry. And this is not just a buzzword. It means getting to people that are not expert EO users. And this is the untapped market. But to do that, we need to bridge that gap. And we need to focus not, uh, not on price. And for sure, we don't want to sell at low prices. We want to sell at the right price. And, but focusing on value, understanding what, how is Earth observation solving the problems of our potential customers. And this means that we need to sit down next to them and help them to understand exactly on their operations how will Earth observation change their game. And so we are looking into departing from these business models which are the standard that we are used to having in the industry selling X euros per square kilometer and then you get a 60% discount. Well, don't quote me on this, but uh, and you get some type of discount to going on what is actually uh, the product that that client needs. For instance, is it a, um, a report on what type of mineral is in this area? Does it make sense that it pays a square kilometer? And if it's a railway manager, does it make sense that he has to pay all the, area, the surrounding area? So understanding the customer, understanding how they see Earth observation, and that they do not have to pay for a square just because our satellite takes square images. And so actually reaching to the customer. And that's where we see the untapped market. That's where Geosat wants to be, uh, providing these tailored solutions for this new uh, era where I think non-expert EO users will lead the market. Thank you very much. Maybe one, you can also add on where you see the biggest opportunity for the future of participation in Europe. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I think we provide, as any other company, a particular perspective for Earth observation. We are a company that looks uh, at the market from the heart of a camera, from the intimate knowledge of the light uh, that the camera uh, produces, trying to deliver the final solution that is meaningful, as Francisco was mentioning. Now, sometimes I think we have been uh, going through a push market of technologies uh, that has created, I think, a nice market, but I think it's time to center the activity in the customer demands and try to understand how we have to reshape the industry towards the industry dem the, the customer demands rather than the push uh, the push factor and this is critical no? today we are uh, we are in our 10th mission so we, we have already flown three flight missions uh, next year we have another this 23 another three missions and there are some confidential missions and in total uh, we are we are moving into into the 10th uh, uh, flight mission and uh, this, the, the scope is always the same is uh, starting from 
a problem. Um, we try to develop uh, the camera, the adapt the camera technology that produces the final impact uh, in the market, rather than flying crazily around the world, trying to capture things, to store servers, and to hope that someone will ever look at the data that is stored over there. That makes no sense anymore. I think it's time that we focus into methane detection for customers, into fire detection, into uh, critical elements that the space is there to solve the real critical problems. That's great. Um, thanks a lot for that practical spin at the end, which makes a good connection to you, Sandra. Um, I think we, can, we already heard there is a lot of ideas, a lot of talent um, in our other continent, but sometimes um, we lack when it comes to turning ideas into business. So, how is Starburst supporting commercialization in the space sector? And uh, can you tell us more about the expansion? I'm sure if people heard my question. So, with pleasure. So, thank Starburst you. Starburst and expansion. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, indeed, uh, we can feel. Uh, that uh, we are experiencing uh, at the moment uh, uh, a renaissance uh, kind of uh, the, the space industry. And what is the most exciting <coughs> thing to, to me or to, to us in the, this uh, industry is uh, the arrival of those, uh, new, this new generation of uh, crazy, uh, ambitious, talented, uh, and courageous um, entrepreneurs. Because um, indeed, uh, f facts are that uh, there are more and more objects in space. Uh, the, the number has been uh, multiplied by thousands the last decade, and it, it, this number will continue to to grow. Uh, this uh, ecosystem is uh, bubbling. Uh, we see the creation of uh, hundreds of startup, uh, even in Europe. Uh, and to me, it's still not enough. We need more. Uh, more of that kind of a of startup. Um, there is a market. Uh, we uh, estimated that uh, 2022, uh, the space business or the space market, it was uh, over uh, 450 billion uh, and 25 to 30 percent of that in Europe, mainly in services, in space services now. And we assume, uh, or we are in the team of the people that assume that it will become a trillion uh, market. So uh, saying that, uh, we definitely need a very space for everyone. We should uh, maybe also, uh, what's a pity that we don't have a, a old space, legacy, traditional player, I don't know how, how to call it uh, here, because uh, uh, we, we need uh, to work all together, of course, and to stop to oppose those uh, two words or teams, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, and how to support them and to help them. Um, so that's where Starburst and Expansion have the, have the ambition and the role to, uh, um, to, uh, to bring a, a solution. Uh, uh, first, the startup, they need visibility. They need, as we said, to have the access to those uh, big players. Without those big players, there is no startup. Uh, we need to have access to uh, the test facilities, to some IPs, to some technology pa parts. So this world will be consolidated in a few years. Uh, uh, so they already all need to work and to go on the path uh, together. That's uh, uh, Starburst as an accelerator is bringing <coughs> everyone around the table working together and we built dedicated program uh, for space, aerospace, especially now regional programs. So Starburst, it's a worldwide accelerator. We are around 100 people scouting uh, three, 4,000 startup per year, aerospace and defense startup per year. It's, uh, it's huge. Uh, investing, uh, we invested in 120 of them worldwide, one third of that in Europe. And in Europe, it's a growing no number because it's kind of the time is, uh, is now in Europe. What we observe in the US, where we have uh, also an office, is that where well, we had uh, in 2021, 2022, 30, more than 30 unicorns, unicorns so valued above 1 billion. Uh, and the phenomenon is coming. Uh, in Europe, so one of you guys probably, hopefully. So, and the role of Starburst is, voila, created, creating the best condition to to do so. 
um, acting globally, but with uh, regional accelerators like BLAST that we have in France, and we are working more and more in consortium. Concretely, Starburst cannot do a standalone. You cannot do a standalone, guys, so we have to work together. And BLAST is a consortium of ONERA. It's a French uh, aerospace lab, Ecole Polytechnique, the best, sorry, uh, engineering school uh, in, in France. And we have the ambition to replicate it uh, in Germany. We are working on that now in Spain. And hopefully, on a European level, let's discuss about that uh, with uh, Guillaume <laughs> later. So, uh, and we join Cassini uh, initiatives that there are bridges uh, everywhere. And uh, all that is very nice, but do startups need funds? Huh? And uh, in Europe, we definitely, uh, it's a fact also, are underfunded uh, after uh, some point. But we know that the deep tech uh, venture capital funds will bring higher return on investments in the next, next uh, decade. Okay. We, uh, we know that the startup, uh, the, the high, uh, deep tech startups, they are facing the strong ch challenges our society has. Uh, climate change, uh, sovereignty, uh, deglobalization, uh, decarbonization. Uh, and those startups, deep tech startups, they need specialized investors that are aware of their specificities, from the technology identification uh, to the market fit, to the technology validation, until uh, grabbing, catching the first contract. This is a timeline, this is a, there, those are several gates that are a bit different than software, uh, IT, uh, smart tech, I don't know what, a startup. Uh, so it's, uh, that's why, where, how is born ex uh, expansion fund project that already already started to uh, to deploy capital through its uh, feeder. We already have uh, nine investment, uh, among them launchers, among them uh, SSA, uh, uh, green propulsion system, I'd say. Um, so, um, and what is expansion and why, why it will be successful? Because it's pan-European, we have to think on a European level. So for now, it's a Swedish-French initiative with German advisors uh, and uh, uh, well, as much uh, people around the project as possible. Um, with a big ambition, 300 million fund. We expect the first closing uh, for this summer, so first closing by 100 per, uh, million. And our ambition also is to help and to follow uh, the several rounds from pre-seed to uh, series A. If I'm too long, you have to stop me or that's I can fine. come back. It's fine. Thank you. I think that's exciting news for everyone from the <laughs> startup community, at least for sure. I don't know if you can, yeah, you can hear me now. So now to make it more conversational as well and to focus on the silver linings of our continent, um, I would like to, to ask our panelists today what, according to you, are the biggest opportunities ahead of space entrepreneurship in, uh, in Europe. And please be, be brief so that we can hear everyone and then the others will focus on the challenges. But starting on the opportunities now, Daniel, I would like to, to start with you, please. I think probably the biggest opportunity for Europe is the first fact that we have the entire know-how. Um, so when we actually started with ESAR, we wondered the entire know-how of building a super cost-efficient and, uh, and highly efficient uh, rocket is there. Why is no one doing anything? And so the know-how is there, the research is extremely great. Uh, we have a huge advantage of uh, being able to hire talent globally, as opposed to uh, the US, who basically, especially in the rocket business, can basically hire only US citizens. And so again, there's a huge opportunity there, uh, where basically, again, you just need uh, to have a few entrepreneurs uh, who are bold enough to actually do something with it. And I think Europe just needs a lot more of, uh, of uh, people, and especially women, uh, than, uh, that we can show on panels like this. Uh, great. Chris, do you have anything to add on the opportunities? Even though... I... Hello, again. I feel like Justin Bieber with this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Old Justin Bieber. Um, we can hear it. You know, the biggest opportunity I see is Mars, frankly. Um, I think we set our ambitions too low in this continent, and um, it's quite tough to raise money, but if you don't set a suitable objective, you end up succeeding in a small way. And I'm sick and tired of letting Americans win. 
I think Europe, not the EU, but Europe, and the UK is still part of Europe, can do more on this, and with private funding. My company is 90% privately funded. Why shouldn't we be sending humans to Mars? Why not? Why aren't we doing these things? It's not lack of desire. It's not lack of energy. It's not that we're stupid people. We're incredibly smart. We have a lot of money. If we combine our resources, we can do amazing things. But we don't. I don't know why, but that's the opportunity. Opening the road to an entirely new planet. Great. And thanks for that. Very inspirational indeed. And Alex, maybe you can out to the opportunity. I have to follow the inspirational <laughs> <laughs> talk from Chris. <laughs> no, I think indeed um, with the right vision, vision in place or visions in place um, uh, and, uh, and some of them are there, I believe. Um, maybe not as big as Mars or as far away as Mars, you know, but uh, um, the the opportunity is that we are in a, in a growing market right, and in a growing industry. And that per se is already a big opportunity. We forget that because we are kind of used to it or we became you know, kind of uh, um, comfortable with that. But if you look at the last couple of years, you know, a lot of industries you know, were very much suffering you know, from the pandemic and other things. And in our space industry, you know, we were kind of in our in our own, you know, nice bubble to some extent, right? And I think we should, uh, we should really be thankful for that, for one, but also take this, you know, uh, as an opportunity and uh, make sure that, you know, we are not uh, now kind of trenching down into fights between different launcher companies, you know, and, and stuff like that, but, you know, come together and make sure that there is launching capabilities, for example, in Europe, you know, um, that are reliable and that can be used, right? Um, so I think... Uh, it's really the opportunity, a little bit along these lines, you know, to collaborate, you know, to have a cake that is expanding, you know, where people can come to the party, you know, and contribute, rather than having to push someone out in order to, to you know, contribute something, is, is incredible. And it's a really great time to be in, and we should really be, be aware of that, I think. Great. Thanks a lot. And, and then let's focus now on the challenges. Um, Francisco, that falls on you. <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> going, yes, for sure, going from aspiration to challenges. But well, of course, they are somewhat tied because if we want to be aspirational, we need to focus on the challenges. And in fact, I think tied to this opportunity of democratization, uh, we have the challenge of bridging this gap between our industry, which is an institutional industry, and we are used to sell to a very savvy customer, very technology wise customer like ESA and other, for instance, geographical institutes, and we need to go beyond that to people that just see satellite imagery in Hollywood movies and that think that satellites can go and follow a car or something like that. So we need to go beyond this. Actually, I think agility is the, it's the main challenge. And here, well, taking the opportunity that we have European Commission uh, funding entities just leaving this, uh, this idea that when we are going to services, we need a different mindset. For instance, if I don't sell a product today, I can sell it tomorrow. If I don't sell an orbit today, I will never sell it again. So we are bringing the hotel industry to the realm of space. And this requires the sense of urgency that we have on our day to day because we, in the end of the, year, the day we pay salaries and we pay our costs and we need to provide the revenue to our shareholders and stakeholders at the same time making a better world through fighting climate change and everything else. This benefits also from some agility, this agility that Guillaume was saying, and I see some strong developments in the past year, let's just say that. But this will be interesting, for instance, also like pilot markets. Let's, let's check, there are some markets we still don't know where they are going. Let's try to find a pilot market to, to tackle that. This could be some type of challenge. And as uh, I think Diane read from Starburst, Sander was saying, sorry, uh, having this following a company from the beginning until, to, until the end, not all of us will go public. Not all of the companies will go public. Some of them will not want to go public, but there might be an opportunity for that as well. So, my keyword would be agility on the challenges on all players, on our side and on the other players as well. Great. Well, thanks a lot for that. And Jorn, do you have something to, to add on that? Sure. 
to me, challenges. to me, it really challenges. I'm good for challenges. Um, I think it comes down to three simple things, and it's uh, the speed, it's the mentality, and uh, the way we buy services right now. I think uh, if you look at speed, um, we heard that in, in other panels today as well. Um, we are very slow with things that we do in Europe, generally. If you look at how long decisions take in every kind of institutional entity, um, if you see how long development cycles take for new products to come into life and compare that to the US, uh, we are nowhere close to being competitive on a worldwide scale. I think that is something we seriously need to change if we want to be competitive and if we, if we as Europe want to play a role on, in the world. Right? Our population is decreasing. I think uh, 100 years ago we had, I don't know, 20% of the world's population. In 100 years it will be 3 or 4%. So our role in, in the world is diminishing. And it's for up, up for us to decide, can we change the way we are doing things and deciding things to maybe gain some momentum in here and play a vital role in that. And that comes a lot with mentality, the way decisions are taken. Um, I think risky decisions is typically nothing a politician would do. Right? Why should he? It's uh, putting his job at risk. So in that sense, um, taking decisions in development programs is the total wrong way to put things up. So it's, it doesn't really fit. So in that sense, we need to change that mentality in the way we buy things and buy services. Right? Why should politicians decide with uh, no appetite for risk about development programs and how to do things and where to buy which service? It doesn't make any sense. So in that sense, we need to change that overall. Buy service, when there are four launch companies here, who knows who will make it? No one. Not even us, every one of us would say, we, us here, yes. <laughs> but we really don't know. And in that sense, they should just put a bit of money anywhere. And there needs to be a perception and a change of mentality in public awareness as well that it's okay if three of these companies fail and the politician can, can, politician can still keep his job. It's fine. It's, it was a good bet. It's good to do bets. It's good to take risk to actually nurture this commercial and uh, privately, privately funded competition to get to better service levels and a different kind of speed and the mentality and a, a picture of Europe that I would like to see, including UK, Chris. So in that sense, really make an encompassing change for the role that this area around here, let's say it that way, plays in the world. Thanks a lot. Well, indeed, speed, risk, agility. Uh, Ruhr, I want to go to, back to you again, because if I'm not mistaken, it's since 20, 2011 that yes. you're in raising in, the, in this uh, game of entrepreneurship. So maybe you already overcame some challenges. Yes. So I, I am thinking about the opportunity, or the question, the original question was the, which opportunities we have here in Europe. So uh, I want to, uh, or let me defend our micro launcher colleagues here, because when we found the company, uh, five years ago, uh, or before the foundation of PLD Spain, was founded small launcher companies in the States, like SpaceX, Blue Origin, X-Core Aerospace, Armadillo Aerospace, all the internet guys that they want to billionaires, uh, uh, they put a lot of money in, uh, in the space industry. So let me defend the specific opportunity in the micro launcher segment, because um, I think with less resources, uh, or with less opportunity with less, let me say, money, or with less heritage in the, in the commercial part of the access to space business, we are at the same level than the many of the other micro launchers worldwide. So we are looking face to face to our colleagues in the States, in China, other parts of Asia. So I think Europe has the opportunity to be the lead of this topic. I think we glo globally, not, not, not in Europe. So um, I think that the college of the, let me say, of the main um, space businesses that we, uh, or as, as European citizens, we feel that we are followers in many things. And we are, oh, look at the Starlink. We need to do our Starlink. Look at that. We need to do the other things. I think in the micro uh, topic, we, we, we have the opportunity to lead something. Uh, I, I'm sure that there will be another opportunity like this, but, uh, but I know indeed that one. So uh, I will be super sad if, if we miss that opportunity. So I don't know how many we will succeed in our technological development, business approach, and so on. But, but uh, I want, as a European citizen, I want to see one of us selling many rockets per year. So, and I think Europe has that amazing opportunity today.
Oh, thanks a lot, Ru. Um, actually, there's one interesting element that I did not mention. Juan, about you, I'm being the president of the Young European Enterprises Syndicate for Space. Um, so maybe you can give us also another perspective about the opportunities or the challenges, as you wish to. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, we represent a collective uh, that is, is an opportunity and is facing the challenges. No? I think if we take the book of challenges, uh, we have to talk about technology, regulation, capital, people, and we should discuss, I think, a while uh, out of the, each of those topics that are quite common in Europe, no? uh, the lack of, lack of people, uh, and therefore how we anticipate this lack of people in general, uh, not only engineers, uh, the lack of capital, um, the, the facing of international markets, the regulation that is to come, uh, and so many, but we, we would be lost. I think in this, in this environment, I would like to take one, a single topic, and that is the quality of the collaboration, public-private. Uh, because there's these public-private partnerships, which have an extensive, I think, regulation, we have the Article 187 in the Treaty of the Union for the joint undertakings, we have the Association for Innovation that enables uh, states to purchase things that do not exist. So we have, I think, a vast uh, uh, situation of, of instruments. Uh, let me say that this week is a week of uh, celebration because uh, the European Commission and ISA have not only talked, they have put a novel practice uh, with, through the Copernicus contributing missions, and it's, it's an incredible step ahead. No? I would say this, this should be only the beginning of a change because when we see the total numbers and in our observatory, yes, we can see what is our, our turnovers and how much institutional business and so on, we realize that uh, most of the sector is relying, especially in upstream, on institutional budgets. Uh, so there is much to improve uh, in the area of, of this efficiency because th th they can really very much uh, multiply the effect. Or you were mentioning that only 10% only is, is institutional for you. Uh, so uh, we, we could really increase with the same amount uh, the impact of Europe in the world through novel mechanisms of public-private collaboration. So I would uh, advocate for a, this toolbox review on what should we look at. No? If I had a tool to sell uh, in Ghana, no? um, that, that would help me uh, as, as, I mean, as, as uh, some, some uh, empires in the world do, like China, no? that bring the finance project to the customer and bring the final solution solved. Um, and then you have a mix of, let's say, anchor, uh, anchor witness uh, to, to launch and also accompanying financing measures and so on. I think we, the, the sun would be brighter because we don't need more resources. We need to revisit how we apply the public-private uh, elements. Thanks a lot. Sandra, I'm turning again to you. Uh, maybe you can give us advice or <coughs> panelists about how to overcome challenges. Advice about what, what startup uh, you should start or where where we should go. Um, uh, actually, uh, when I when I'm listening to to this panel, um, it makes me uh, happy uh, to live nowadays. Uh, even if, of course, uh, population is decreasing, climate is changing, but. Uh, um, now we can not only dream about space, but we can fulfill also this dream. Um, and I see that even more, uh, even more real for my seven years old daughter, for her it's so uh, familiar uh, what we are talking about. And uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's terrific actually when you think about it uh, a little bit compared to 20, 30 years ago. It's accessible and we can act and we can take part to, to this uh, uh, journey and it's uh, fantastic and as I didn't want to choose one project or one segment I chose to work uh, <coughs> uh, and to, to co-found the uh, Starburst and Expansion so it gives me the opportunity to to work a little bit or to take part a little bit to all uh, the emerging uh, uh, and coming uh, startups. Now if I have to uh, dedicate specifically uh, my time to uh, to one topic, uh, one challenge, one segment. What what is the coming hot hot topic? Uh, I say, 
uh, I definitely go for uh, the uh, uh, the startups or the projects that are having an impact uh, on the uh, ecological uh, transition. Uh, definitely, uh, there you have as an investor you have a, a huge coming uh, business. There is a huge need of tools, uh, measures. Uh, and everything to, uh, to, 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 to work on those, uh, this topic. Um, and uh, the, new, the space and the new space uh, can have a huge impact on that. Huh? Is that upstream, upstream or down, uh, downstream? Uh, uh, upstream, uh, of course, we, we, we have to work on uh, deorbiting uh, uh, already, SSA surveillance, uh, green uh, uh, propellant. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, downstream, what will be key is the data and the, the way you uh, grab the data and what you do with that, how do you interpret the data and how do you sell that and how it will help to influence and to help us to coordinate our infrastructure projects, the urbanization of our countries, cities, and, of course, the, the way they help us to monitor uh, the uh, climate uh, changes and, and the Earth's uh, evolution. So that's uh, where I go to. Well, thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting. As we are turning close to an hour, um, I know that, Guillaume, we're going to close with you the first part of this discussion. Before we continue with David, who we'll agreed to stay with us for another half an hour, second part on VC. So please, the floor is yours. I can also give you the... No, it's fine. It's fine. You can... You can I mean, uh, no, I'm not uh, making any push here. So, uh, <laughs> uh, no, first, uh, I'd like really to, to thank you all. So if I, if I take, like, a keyword from each of us, uh, Daniel, you said people, Chris, Mars, Alex, growing market, Francisco, democratization, beyond speed, uh, Raul selling several rockets per year, Juan, public-private cooperation, Sandra, accessibility of the space sector. And actually, it's like, okay, I, I do have a clear task and roadmap for this year, so I'll take that with me. And I think the responsibility of the, of the Commission and of the European Space Agency, listening to what you've said, is quite simple at that point of time. We, are, we don't have to be selective. We need to enable the entire startups ecosystem to grow up. We are not at the stage where we can pick up and select the best solutions. It's way too early. We need to do the same way the US have done a few years ago, enable the entire ecosystem to grow and scale up. And then in a couple of years, two, three, four years, this is the right time then to be more selective. And that's why I think we need to give a chance to all of you uh, to, to really demonstrate what, what you have, uh, what, you can, what you can provide a solution. So for me, what we should do uh, in the coming two years, one is skills. Uh, I like really to flag skills. Skills, we know this is really an issue for many of you when you are l trying to hire people, certain competencies, this is an issue. And here I'd like to turn to you because it's your responsibility as well <coughs> to go to universities, to create vocation, to explain what you do, because you are the ones uh, that can inspire dreams. And you have to take a bit of your time and go to universities, to schools, to really speak about what you do and create vocation. You have then to, to turn to universities and to build up partnership with universities. Sometimes we see big disconnect between universities and what you need, so you need to plug uh, those disconnects. So skill really is kind of top priority. Capital. Number one, we, we, we know this is a big challenge, but when I mean capital, it's grants, equities, and loans. It is not just equities. Equities, we know we are working on that. It's loans as well, because at some, at some point of time, company like yours will not go for equities anymore. You don't want to dilute your ownership. You want to remain in control, and that's why you will look for loans. And we need to ensure that loans are available in Europe as well, be it through the European Investment Bank or uh, through commercial banks. Three, uh, we need uh, tools. We need to continue putting on the table some tools that can develop each of us depending on the stage of development of your company. And I'd like here to mention two things uh, that was not mentioned before. IOD IUV, we have a large program on IOD IUV to give you flight heritage when you have tests. If you want to test in real conditions a new technology, that's a service that we can offer for free in the Commission. And I'd like to mention the business service accelerator that will be 
public very soon to give you some advice, coaching, to develop further your company. Uh, have a business uh, strategy, uh, but better selling the product. So that's something that we will uh, put on the table very soon. Fourth, risk, risk taking, fully agree. And, and I can tell you that there is still a uh, change of mindsets. I mean, the flight ticket initiative, for instance, we will buy, we will pre-book uh, a flight uh, ticket initiative, so uh, booking slots. Uh, some of you will not survive, so that's money that we are investing in your companies, and perhaps we will lose that money. So that's a risk that we are taking, and we are ready to take. Um, and the last part is uh, enthusiasm. You need to keep your enthusiasm. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of the fact that we're all happy to be there, so that's something that we can be proud of, uh, that enthusiasm, uh, because it generates ideas, it's what we need. So keep uh, that enthusiasm very high, uh, and, and let's uh, make it... Uh, I mean, let's turn that into something that will be tangible for our future generation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Please. <laughs> I know that you're yeah. also <laughs> moderating other sessions. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll slowly move on to the next part of our discussion, which will be more focused on VC and on the actual access to finance frameworks. And David, of course, I'll start with you. Um, and maybe in terms of VC fund investment, what are biggest challenges from your perspective? What are you looking for to see in a company or in a, um, in a VC fund? Essentially? Just to provide us with the background, please. Uh, maybe I'll wait for Guillaume to be out to come back on the selectivity topic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, joke aside, we are, um, as I said, mainly, if not only, investing into funds, but we are also doing a couple of co-investments alongside the VC funds that we've backed. Yep, sorry. Okay, getting closer. Yeah. So we, we are doing fund investment, which is the main and core business of EIF, but also some co-investments. Uh, what we are looking for is something that is useful for the market. No more than that, but no less than that either. Meaning that if that's just something nice to have, uh, it might not be uh, that useful to spend money, and especially public money, uh, because we have a responsibility to look for something which creates value. Each and every time we make a decision, we are looking for this adding value a component, which is very important. And for instance, when we are looking at a fund investment proposal, we are looking for and we are expecting a combination of different kind of skill sets. We are not looking for people with a 15 or 20 years investment track record in space. It does not exist. Not yet. So we are looking for people with investment experience, but also at the same time, people with technological and, and sector expertise, networks, um, capacity to advise a company on their expansion, on their growth, to help them uh, interacting with some specific clients, should they be public, private, big corporates, whatever. So we are always looking for what is a USP the specific uh, element that will differentiate, We're coming back to this question of differentiation, at a fund level as well, we are looking for the ones that will be selected by the best entrepreneurs. Because despite what is happening on the market now, and especially for the last uh, 12 months, which have been quite difficult, uh, we are convinced that the good entrepreneurs will have the choice. They will have uh, a number of investors willing to work with them to invest in their company. And there is still money available on the market. So we are looking for the ones that will be chosen by those uh, good entrepreneurs with the best opportunities. And again, if they don't provide anything else than capital, it will not be sufficient. So that's what we are looking for. And when it comes to companies, it's slightly different. Not that we are also looking for profits, for sure, but more to accompany those companies when it's about raising bigger rounds. Because we all know that uh, in Europe, and not only for space, it's a, a generic issue we have for with whichever technological uh, sector. When it comes to the bigger rounds, so the later rounds, when a company needs to raise 40, 50 million euros and plus in a single round, there's basically no one or very few players capable of signing such big checks. So we can help on, the, on this front as well. This is something which is more a kind of a political view to keep those companies European over a longer period of time. Thanks a lot, David. Um, just for the remaining part, I would like to make another round of, uh, for our panelists so that we can understand better the challenges that they, that they face and what's, what's their ask of the VC funds and the access to finance. Sandra, David, please feel free to interrupt at any point if you want to, to comment. Um, okay, so maybe, Jorn, I'll start with you again um, this time. What about the risk appetite in the investor mindset? 
how do you assess that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic question. Um, you know that we have a strategic investor in our company with OHP. Um, they are fully behind it. So for us, it gives us a, um, a great stability, I would say. Right? There has been crazy times in terms of fundraising for a lot of companies in the space industry throughout the recent months. And in that sense, uh, we can be very happy to have a strategic, um, let's say, anchor investor and also anchor customer for the future at our side, which uh, by its nature, I think it's a very unique setup, uh, a worldwide scale. I think we're the only startup that really has such a relationship where someone is that where we have great access to know-how, but is, who acts with financial support, but let's say, a number of launches for the future at the same time, and we can only be very happy. With that, having said that, um, matching a strategic finance entity with a VC entity is uh, not always the easiest task. Cassandra probably can sing a song out of that and what she's <laughs> teaching in her accelerator programs. And we said, yeah, obviously, uh, we are still looking for more financial partners. I would be happy to talk, but yeah, not easy. Thanks a lot for that. Um, and Alexander, you mentioned just earlier that um, the institutions play the role um, in your growth. And the, the European, uh, European Commission and ESA is in the beginning. Can you give us a bit of more of um, an assessment of how much is their, let's say, um, contribution for making Imposion a success story today? Yeah, I think, I feel like we kind of skipped a step there in the sense that uh, we skipped the VC you know, kind of uh, funding step, right? So we had the, the technological funding in the beginning, right? The, the, I wouldn't even say early stage company-wise, but, you know, really the, the technology development funding, even in the academic uh, kind of realm. And then, you know, with this unique opportunity or, or time in which we were, you know, we could, um, with very little um, private investment, you know, and, and push we could go to a stage where we then went to the third uh, part that Guyo mentioned, which is loans, right? So at some point, you know, you want to have instruments where you don't have to, you know, give, as, as, as you mentioned, you know, give away equity, but you want to get loans. Obviously, you are a young company, you're, so the bank, you know, is not even allowed to give you money, right? So, and there, this is where institutional instruments are extremely helpful, I, um, in, in my experience, that just guarantee those loans, so I think these uh, instruments, at least, you know, in Austria we have those, you know, and we've been using them quite, uh, quite a lot, and I'm sure there's other opportunities like that in, in Europe. If not, there should be. Uh, where basically banks who want to invest, you know, and who, or not even invest, you know, who want to, you know, kind of um, have a relationship with a growing company who is already, you know, um, on a scaling trajectory, um, but are somehow bound by their own regulations, right, because of the... Uh, the, the uh, the maturity of the company and the history behind it and so on are backed by guarantees from institutions, right? And I think this combination is something that whether you have VC funding before or not, you know, and depending on the kind of, you know, scale you're working at, it's definitely an instrument in that toolbox that uh, was very important for us and that I believe for, for many others, you know, is also something that is, uh, is very valuable in growing the business. Well, thanks a lot for that, and, and staying on the on the same topic. I think Chris, you mentioned that you rely 90% on private money. But do you um, can you like explain more about how do you assess, let's say, the way the European public money is funneled through the VCs, through VC venture <laughs> capital? Yeah, I think the last thing you should do is give your money to VCs. Frankly, they are so risk averse, particularly in Europe. Um, there's no differentiation between a company that needs an IKEA table and a laptop and one that needs eight years of hard capex investment to get the job done, none. These are, the risk adjusted return is all that matters. And the risk adjustment for a company with an IKEA table and five Dell laptops is non-existent. The risk adjustment in a company like mine or Daniel's or Jorn's or Raul's is insane. We can't compete on equal terms. Now there are some VCs out there luckily and Daniel and I and Raul have been fortunate to get that, some of that backing, but they're very rare. They're very rare compared to America where there are incredibly deep pockets of money. And that's why you see companies moving to America to find those bigger rounds. I just closed a $50 million round in November, but it was pretty hard work to get it. Pretty hard work, I can tell you. And it's, it, it gives you a sense of the scale. In the UK, there are 50 rounds that are $50 million or above annually. Five zero, that's it. So we got ours for that week. I don't know what the numbers are in Germany and France and Italy, but I suspect they're of a similar order of magnitude given the EU, the EU VC market. So if you're going to give your money to VCs, you should set different 
hurdle rates for specific types of industries. You should perhaps look at taxation regimes that reward deep tech, long-term, high capex, high risk investments, because they do pay off if they're given those chances. But if you don't get the capital early on, what are you left with? You're left with launches that fail, other companies flying twice a week, and dominating the market. That's the truth of the matter. And I would like to see my company succeed. I think it might be one of the ones that succeeds. We'll see. Good luck, you guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, you know I, I often say cash is the real rocket fuel of our company. Without the cash, you can't hire good staff. You can't buy the materials. You can't buy the machines facilities. So without the money, we can all go home. Right? That's it. Don't give them your money. <laughs> Find new VCs. I'd happily start a new VC company focused on hard tech. Hard tech. Long-term, deep um, IP, deep capex, long investment cycles. I'd happily start that with my own money. And I have some. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> Maybe um, I can turn back to you, David, for a comment on that. And how do we tackle the risk averseness? I think something to keep in mind uh, is that if you look back 20 years ago where the European VC market was, uh, we were nowhere. So I'm not saying that not everything works well, but I think it has improved a lot. Looking at the performance and number of uh, unicorns, even though unicorns are not the, my preferred uh, KPIs to see whether an ecosystem uh, is doing well or not, but still, uh, it has grown a lot. And um, you can only see that, um, taking again the EIF example, I joined the IEF almost a bit more than 12 years ago. We were seven in the VC team, making 300 million euros a year of investment. It used to represent 45% of the European VC markets at that time. Last year, so end of 2022, we are 45 in the team. We signed 3.4 billion euros of investment, which represent 15 to 20% of the market. So it shows that there's something happening. It might not be perfect, for sure, but uh, we, as Europeans, have been able to attract a lot of uh, foreign money, especially coming from the US. The main issue is that indeed it comes a lot uh, to non-European players when we are talking about bigger rounds, and that's why we are developing an initiative, maybe not the best place to talk now, but you may hear, will hear about that in the future, this European Tech Champion Initiative for bigger uh, late stage funds. So there's, there are things happening. Indeed it takes time. It takes time, but uh, we are all uh, willing to do what is expected, what is needed for the good of the market. And again, I think some VCs are maybe a bit uh, disappointing, but uh, generally speaking, we, and not only us, but all the LPs, all the investors into VC funds, try to do their best to select the, the ones that we think and we assess as being well equipped to deliver. And uh, again, we, can, uh, we cannot do everything by ourselves. And this is my last comment on this point. Um, we need private investors as well. And that's why I think to have really the, the space market, the new space industry in the tech uh, and startup environment in Europe taking off, we need big successes. This is how it starts. You need big successes, not tens, two, three ones, which will show to the private investors that it can work and they can generate profits out of it. And then they will start investing more regularly in the field. Seems a bit like a chicken and egg problem. But Sandra, you wanted to... <laughs> um, yes, I, I think we are beyond the chicken and egg. Uh, and indeed, uh, when you see that VCs are risk adverse, it might be the case. Uh, there is a clearly a clear trend now uh, before the investment of the government investment in companies or space companies or startup where the were majority. Uh, now the, the, this is becoming the opposite. Yeah, you have more and more private investment. It's also because the KPIs are, are here. Now the, the, the time from uh, creating your start, uh, startup and uh, becoming a unicorn, it's uh, one KPI still, uh, it's four years in average for five years. So it's becoming uh, uh, an area where a private investor, classic investors can imagine to, uh, to invest. What is the challenge is that here in Europe, because we are speaking of huge amounts, and now if you reach the Serie B, C, that's where, where we are talking. Uh, we have to talk more seriously. Is today who is able to follow up? Uh, and uh, to raise a fund like expansion fund, it has to be 
uh, also in uh, fin, think, fin, with the support of uh, public initiatives like EAF or BPI in France or CDTI in Spain or I don't know uh, what are the others uh, and also uh, bridged with uh, initiatives like Cassini. But I have the feeling that uh, we are, uh, the planet are aligned, uh, as we used to say in, uh, in France. No, thanks a lot for that. I'll, I'll continue the, the Q&A with the panelists. And Ru, let me turn to you then. I mean, you have enough to comment on. I don't know if you need a specific question now. <laughs> can you just react? Yes, so um, for example, our vision about VCs, um, we start the company uh, uh, or I remember quite well our seed round of investment, that there was no ecosystem. So we fulfilled uh, our first round using uh, money from business angels. So local guys putting 50 keys or 50 keys or six keys or something like that. And, you know, 50 guys, five zero putting small ticket. After that for our series A, uh, we started the relationship with corporate venturing uh, from GMV and Aciturri. That was the leads of our, let me say, first big round of investment in 2016. And uh, after that, there was many followers coming. Just one, uh, I think our cap table has like 12 uh, investors in the company, and we have just one VC with a, with a small um, uh, ticket, you know. So because for, for us, I, I don't know the others, but for us it's super hard to convince let me say the current uh, VCs uh, in, 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 in Europe uh, to invest in, in, in a project that does because they don't want to, you know, the thesis that doesn't fit. They have the rules, if you check, check, check. So for us it's super hard to fill, you know, to check all the boxes. So, and to be honest with you, uh, uh, in the past, let me say three years, we removed the VC as a target for us because I think the, the VCs that it will be, let me say, compliant with us, or compatible with us, uh, it's, uh, you know, we need to develop that ecosystem, but we need the money this year. Mm -hmm. So um, there are just a few. So in my roadshow, for example, for our next round of investment, I think in the funnel we have like four VCs in Europe to, to call. So the roadshow, it will take two days. So, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I cross my fingers, maybe someone <laughs> say yes, but, uh, uh, and all that guys, they are also calling the same four guys. So. <laughs> uh, the competition is quite hard in the in the VC segment. So, um, for example, we are following other trends. Like for example, there are private uh, equity uh, companies that they are more in the revenue part. But you know, so there are some that they are interested on in that to put, let me say, big round of investment that we need to achieve the market. So, um, and also customers because for us, for example, it's important to start to you know to to receive revenues from the future for today, so uh, I think institutions has a strong paper on that, the flight ticket opportunity, it's, I think it's the best idea <laughs> that we can uh, execute because I can say to the investor that there are a market because mm -hmm. we have a pre book flights, you know, all the investors, they are looking about how many reservations you have and you need to say, no, no, but I don't have the rocket yet. So we are trying to, you know, to deal in with uh, non-binding contracts or, con or binding contract with many ifs. If you delay, I, I cancel the contract. So. Um, I think we need to, uh, our case and I think the others, we need to pass that, uh, you know, that uh, trip <laughs> uh, until, uh, until we will uh, achieve the market. No, thanks a lot for that. Um, Daniel, I haven't, I haven't come to you and, yeah, I mean, for access to private capital in Europe, what's your take on that? I think it's... I think it's today already a very different environment than four or five years ago. Um, when we spoke to our first investor in 2018, uh, the usual first answer was, what the fuck did you guys smoke? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, because they're like, what are you doing in space? Why do we use space at all? There, there was zero connections. Now, thanks to a lot of big US companies also, uh, space became, in general, a much more household industry in a way that 
you follow up on it, there's super exciting stuff happening where people obviously can, can follow. Uh, now with uh, uh, things such as recent SLS launch, um, the Americans uh, going back to the moon, uh, these are all things that inspire a lot of people. Um, and um, I think it drives also the space industry towards, uh, towards VCs uh, more closely. So um, today, actually, if you take a look at, uh, at many of the US deep tech VCs, uh, you will barely find anyone without a space investment. I mean, almost every deep tech uh, fund in the US, uh, actually almost every US VC fund uh, probably did, uh, did space investments. Um, if you take a look at the European VCs, not so many did it. Um, so we've been happy to, to uh, count quite a few of them as our supporters and investors. Um, I think at the end of the day, it always comes down to people they invest in. Uh, so whether you build a software company, whether you build a rocket company, uh, whether uh, you build an uh, AI company, um, people still invest in, uh, in the people behind. Uh, if you can uh, convince as a team that, uh, that you should put money there, uh, then uh, at the end, it doesn't matter actually whether you build an AI company or, or a rocket or a satellite company. And so I think there's obviously a lot of, uh, as Sandra put it, a lot of stars have to align uh, in order to make sure that uh, you can actually build a, a successful business out of it. Um, but uh, for sure we can, uh, we can uh, uh, definitely need a bit more courage from uh, European VCs. Um, we've been speaking to a lot of family offices because money itself actually is not the problem. Just in German bank accounts, there's a trillion euros. But it's just sitting there, you yeah? know? Where, where are the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurial stories that uh, we could build out of Europe uh, if we just deploy the money? As Chris put it before, sometimes you just need to pay the salaries and you need to buy the machines. And it's just going to cost a little bit of money. Um, and so in that case, I think there's uh, still a lot to learn for Europe uh, to take more risk. And uh, not only to trying to minimize the risk, but trying to maximize the potential return. And kind of that the difference in, in mindset, especially towards uh, US, Middle Eastern uh, funds, et cetera, is uh, quite significant with a significant impact of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of the entire industry and ecosystem around. Well, thanks, Arj. You touched upon a very interesting topic about our education and how much we understand how investment works in Europe. Because I know in the US people know from before they graduate high school what an investment is, how to take a risk and uh, to make money out of it. Just to complete the picture, and Francisco, I'm turning to you because in Earth observation market, it's a bit different in a way. Like, could you give us uh, your take? Yes, well, <laughs> <laughs> well uh, actually, yes, it's challenging. I was thinking about that and just hearing Daniel here. Um, I think actually there's an issue, I have mostly anecdotal evidence, but every time that you go with a business plan that ends, ends or has a launch in the middle and you say that you will have to an investor, you'll have to spend everything up until this point and you start getting your money five years after and you'll get a return ten years after and they ask you, okay, but what's the early exit? There's no early exit. <laughs> if you exit before the launch, there's no launch, there's no business plan, there's no revenue. Um, so this... We every time found this to be a challenge. Uh, we have acquired satellites already in orbit. This was more or less a different challenge. So it, um, it overcame more or less, it overcame more or less this, uh, this egg and chicken problem that we have been discussing. But to be honest, I respect that other people don't want to put their money in. I understand there's a risk. There are business plans that probably provide them return on investment in two to three years. So why wait 10 years in, that, in something that has a launch in the middle? I hope that with all of these companies, reliability will increase significantly, but, but up, up until now in Europe, it's a risk. And we know it's a risk. That's why we have relaunch insurance. Um, so this is one. Uh, but then the other effect that we have also noticed, and maybe this can be a way to look at it, it's the, it's the I would say, something uh, trust effect. When you have an, one investor coming in, that's a, that's a factor that facilitates other investors coming on board. And so we, we have had meetings with investors when we asked, but wh why have you invested in this company? They said, oh, because the other guy invested. So we trust them and then we invest it, but we don't know anything about it. Maybe some, um, well, some uh, pilot uh, investors, some more, uh, uh, some investors that can take maybe with some public support can take some more risk than the regular investor that might have trillions, but they want, they want it from themsel for themselves. Uh, that might be an issue. Also something interesting, and I think here the UK is one of the countries in Europe where we have good lessons, is the forward-looking procurement. 
It's for a company, sometimes we don't need subsidies. We need to have somewhat of predictability in terms of what the market will be. Um, and just knowing this, this helps us to bring confidence to our business plans and also to the people that are putting money on them. Oh, thanks a lot for that. Um, and maybe, Juan, you mentioned in one of our chats before uh, the panel difference between buying solutions and supporting capacity. Do you want to explain that better now? Like, how do you, let's say, how do you assess the difference between, between that in terms of risk, for example? I think uh, uh, it should be a dedicated topic, no? <laughs> um, I, 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 would, I, I think I would rather comment, if you allow me, um, that we have to, our job is to change the perspective. So if things are wrong and we don't find the money, we have to change, come again into the room and start again with a new, uh, new light and a new argument over there. No? Do you think that energy companies are uh, risk-taking companies? I mean, they are doing corridors of hydrogen, putting hundreds of million in the last year, expecting that there is cars that will stop, or I don't know which type of devices will stop uh, over there in the road to, to, to fill in uh, hydrogen, no? They, they are doing that. So it, everything is relative, and I think you need to, write, to, to take the right perspective. We have a gas company uh, that is an investor in Atlantis, in Agas. We have another gas company in the US, Williams. Uh, we have a pension fund. We don't have VCs. Um, and we have CDTI. We also have a 24% public stake uh, coming to the company. So the thing is to find the right message uh, that, uh, that you can share with the investor in, in your company and then share the project and understand that the challenges that, that you discuss together need an alliance in the long run. An alliance means you have to invest in my company and we have to have the patience of an uh, agenda for, for four years, for eight years to, to solve uh, your problems, to provide the capacities that you don't have. And I think, so this is a little bit answering your, your first question. So, I think the way to, to, to connect to capacities uh, is also through capital. And many times, uh, industrial investors uh, are ready to understand that you solve some problems for them, not today, but uh, you, 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 you jointly can calibrate, can understand what is gas emissions, and uh, finally can arrive to, to a solution. And we could put several verticals to say this is a routes and examples where we can focus into problems with the big users that have money to invest and then put the adventure together uh, to do that. So I think we have to go to our grandparents' uh, uh, mentality that didn't know what was an exit or didn't know what was a VC. They just, just, just got up early and went to the factory <laughs> to work and produce, no? Yeah. So maybe this is the future of Europe, no? That we have to go again to the factory, wake up early, and, and then work for the long run, because there is no shortages, there is no fast tracks. No. Thanks a lot. Very, very nice. As you're moving towards the end, I don't know if, Sandra, you, have, you want to have make some concluding remarks? No. Oh, pardon, sorry. No, but actually everything what uh, has been said or is said is, is true, but it's not only uh, only uh, the, the truth. I, I really think that here in Europe we are catching up. We we were late. We are still late, uh, uh, depending on the topic. But I really think that uh, <coughs> here, uh, thanks to. Uh, uh, David and Guillaume, uh, we, we see that we have also the most important thing. There is a really a political uh, ambition on a European and national uh, levels that will enable us to... Well, uh, you have people listening to what you're saying. Uh, and in comparison to a few years ago, it was not the case. So, and people are working on those uh, remarks. And if we are here as a private uh, uh, investor, potential investors of your, of your company, it's also a, a positive uh, sign. So, I know it's difficult, but try to hold a little bit more. And we will all together win this uh, uh, space race. Thanks a lot, Sandra. David, any closing remarks on your side? Yeah, <laughs> I think. It's time for Europe to, to catch up, indeed, to wake up and to catch up. Uh, there's a lot of things to do. Uh, we have, as it was already said, we have a lot of, of brains, much more in number within Europe than uh, US and, com and Canada combined. So we have the capacity to, to lead the wave of innovation 
and to come back to where Europe should be, especially when it comes to space. So we should make sure that everyone is aware of that and act in consequence. So yeah, let's move ahead. Perfect. Thanks a lot. But then let's do closing remarks, all of us. Um, at least so that we can we can hear what people learned from the session or what was new. If, if there was something new, I don't know. Maybe let's start like that. Ru. <coughs> Yes, so um, I think uh, we have here in that panel the, let me say, because we are not uh, just uh, an, an, a startup, let me say, seed. So today we are, there are many scale-ups in, uh, in Europe. And I think this is one of the opportunities that uh, we need to push and to, you know, because as want to say, we need to open the door super soon and to deliver everything, this is our responsibility. And uh, from our side, I'm sure that all my colleagues, they are doing that, they are working like hell, so it's super hard to develop these very intensive uh, CapEx uh, businesses. And uh, we are also expecting from the other stakeholders to try to pushing in the same direction, and I think we are sharing that vision and that mission. So let's work and, and, and stay tuned to that year that will be an, uh, historical year in terms of launches. So our first launch and hopefully also the others. So uh, stay connected to the space industry. Thanks a lot, Rup. Daniel. Well, I would uh, second on what, did, what Davis was saying. Uh, we, we need to catch up, but at the same time, uh, we should not only focus on catching up all the times, but we should start moving ahead and, and be the leaders as well. Um, I think Europe can use definitely much more courage uh, to uh, to build and to dream big. Um, uh, sometimes might might sound a bit cheesy. Uh, other people might uh, might dream of more bureaucracy. Even um, I, th I think we have enough of all of that in Europe. Uh, so uh, we need to actually walk the talk and uh, and start doing things to to move forward. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity for commercializing space transportation in Europe right now. There's a big gap um, in terms of access to space that needs fill. Um, there's a lot of companies who want to attempt first launch this year who can potentially fill that, also with future evolutions which are on the horizon. And I think it's a great moment that we're living in. I agree with that, Cassandra. Um, exciting times. I think um, when we all were born, we couldn't have dreamt for a better time to live and to actually see this coming, I don't know, four, five, ten launches this year with new companies. Um, exciting times and I really hope that Europe will uh, start benefiting from that, buying services in a different way, as we said before, um, with a higher risk appetite on failure, so giving more startups the same chance on anchor contracts. Thanks a lot, Alexander. Yeah, thank you. I think all what we said is, is very much valid. I think the, what is important is that we are not only and not solely focusing on you know, how the US is better and we need to catch up and we need to be like the US because you know, it's the land of glory. It is possible, I can tell you, from <laughs> Europe to be the market leader, to sell to the US government because they have no you know, national choices you know, um, and the Japanese government you know, and other you know, institutions globally in Europe, in, in the space industry, which is a very know-how driven industry. And we can in Europe be leaders. We are not like the US, you know, we are different in many ways. In some ways we can learn from them for sure, but in others, other domains, I think we should embrace the fact that we are different, you know, and we're doing things uh, differently. And uh, uh, for me, uh, we've been focusing a lot, you know, on, on venture capital and, you know, uh, money that is available for companies, you know, for sure, you know, that's very important. But it's not just that, then we shouldn't, you know, kind of uh, have, a, have that narrow kind of mindset. I'm sure things like a launch pad where all these guys, you know, can just test their rockets without any bureaucratic hurdles, you know, would be great for all of them. I don't know, you know. And, um, uh, and that's something that is not VC money, you know, that is infrastructure that is provided. Or investment in, in ecosystems, you know, that are developed, you know, whether it's in Toulouse or, you know, in Vienna or somewhere else, right? And I think, you know, we should... Uh, embrace all the other mechanisms where I really believe that uh, Europe is even ahead, you know, in, in the institutional support of companies, you know, than, than the U.S., uh, other than just the money that is that's kind of available. Thanks a lot, Francisco. 
Uh, thank you. Well, for once, for me, it's very enlightening to have the perspective of VCs and people dealing with funding and for the industry to better understand what are the deterrents. Because we can complain, but it's better to understand what are the deterrents and what is preventing funding com VCs and other funding companies to invest in our industry. And as Juanto said, tell the story differently. Um, two takeaways for me also is that, in fact, things are changing a lot and we need to embed this flexibility into our business plans, into our business models, uh, and into everything that we do. But even with the, within this volatility, what doesn't change is the need to provide value to the customer and to the user and to society. This will be the con constant even if we change the ways in which we get there. So if we ground our activities there in getting value to the end user and to the customer, I'm sure that we can navigate this volatility and these uncertainties in funding and everything else. Thanks a lot. Chris. That was a very positive <laughs> conclusion. What, what, are you, what are you expecting no, from no, me? No, no, no. <laughs> Maybe you can finally sing. <laughs> you should finally sing. Yeah, this is the Val Dunican <laughs> moment. Uh, look, I, it's hard to summarize this, but I mean, Orbex is very focused on getting stuff done. And honestly, I don't come to many of these events because it's just talk. And I think that is the core message. Would you just get on and build these things and do them? and stop talking about doing them constantly through a million different workshops and bodies and industrial parties and interests and God knows what else that exists in Europe between the different nation states and levels of bureaucracy and the different political institutions and governmental institutions that I have to deal with incessantly on a daily basis in this highly regulated industry. Our focus is to be vertically integrated, just get on and do it. Occasionally, we have to come to things like this and meet people. <laughs> but we're very uh, introverted, uh, you know, uh, game-playing guys in Orbex. And we'd rather just get on and get the rockets in the air. And um, once that happens, again, I come back to the point I made earlier. Once that happens, I think there'll be a transformation in this particular niche in European space. Once you have private operators launching payloads to successfully to space, I think there'll be a very different conversation to be had with all of those interested parties. And um, there will be real competition for payloads. There will be. And that is going to be a very different world. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Juan. I think we, we live in a sector that is working business to business to business to business to customer. And uh, many of those relationships are needed, for example, the relationship that we have today here with the rocket suppliers, no? uh, that create, I think, a, quite a closed uh, sector. So I would ask, uh, who is outside of space? Who belongs to food, or to insurance, to uh, banking, or whatever? No? So we, we tend to be a community that gets together very happily uh, from time to time. I think uh, this, this, last, uh, uh, this last mile of customer as I think you were mentioning, Francisco, is the key word, to, to start changing the chain back to the very origin, no? uh, with the customer truly in the center. So I think this, this will be my remark. So I think if, if I recall Kennedy, he would say, uh, in this case, it is the customer <coughs> idiot. <No? laughs> well, that was a very good closing. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Well, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, made a lot of notes, but to be honest with me, it was extremely interesting to hear what all of you have to say, and, um, and also having Sandra, David, uh, we also had Guillaume for, um, uh, for one hour. Well, I think the question is clear, more speed, more agility, more money, and uh, <laughs> let's, less risk aversion and being prone to take risks. Um, again, thanks everyone for that. I think it was an amazing session, um, and let's do it. <laughs> Thank you very much.